Hey, welcome everybody. It's another episode of the session. And do we have a doozy for you? I have a bunch of corked and caged bottles in front of me from a little brewery uh, called Ale Song. And they're up in Eugene, Oregon. And I say uh, little brewery uh, smiling because their reputation definitely precedes them, uh, especially down here in the Bay Area. Brian and Doug, welcome to the show, boys. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers right back at you. I was reading uh, a little bit on your website and looking a little bit at uh, the video that looks recently produced. The um, <laughs> That's on your website. It's very good. The, the, the funny thing, quote unquote, funny thing about the the pandemic and the world we live in today is you can sort of now tell when media has been produced because there's masks. Yeah. You know? totally. So I'm like, Oh, okay. This is, Oh, there we go. I can tell this is at least within the last 18 months. So, that's, uh, and I don't know why I think that's, uh, <laughs> I know it's one of those things too, that you don't like notice it until it's too late. And you're like, ah, oh, totally should have taken my mask off. That's no, I personally, <laughs> well, yeah, there's, I'm up to <laughs> minds of it. Cause like, Either I, I like seeing it, and I've, I've been saying since this you know whole lockdown uh, started, uh, at least in California, that this is exactly the stuff I want to see on people's uh, social media. I want to see the staff wearing masks. I want to see all this kind of stuff because it makes me feel comfortable. But then it is right. also like doing a like a political joke on a TV show where it sort of dates your TV show maybe a little bit. So I could see why you'd be like, oh, I should have taken it off. But I think it's, I mean, that's just what it is now, for the, at least for the yeah. next few years but my tasting glass is usually my mai tai glass nice but i'm drinking out of this really cool wine glass because i was inspired by all the glasses and your video you guys have the the very you know yeah uh, we like these the tekus for all of our beers is that what they're called the tekus yeah this is not a teku so yours are a little more shallow and a little more yeah, and it's, it's got the like the angle on it so it's yeah. theoretically that like burst the aroma into your into your nose you know but i think stemware is a great place to start yeah i think so too well i i still have my mai tai glass because i really do like trying uh you know barrel aged beers and and sour beers and beers with brett in different glassware because i'm sort of like i don't know to me like different glassware does bring out different different aromatics and different flavors and i know that's not necessarily like a, a Pulitzer Prize winning, you know, journalistic thought. But, um, it to me, it's very interesting. And that's part of why I gravitate towards beers that you guys produce and, and beers like this in general, is because you can you can play around with it, even after it's, you know, packaged, right? You can play around with it at home, you can try different glasses, mine's apparently dirty. So excuse me, I'm gonna do some bar work. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, we prefer our, our beer. I mean, I think we think it tastes best in the stemware, but we've definitely had it, you know, you take it to a football game if you want and you drink it straight out of the bottle or like red solo cup is fine too, you know, whatever you want to do. Yeah. All right. I'll do that. If I have, we're not snobs here. No, you're not. Well, and I think that's the, the sort of myth of, uh, I mean, uh, let's just say a cork and caged beer, right? Where it's, oh, well, these guys must be snobberinos because they're they're barrel aging all their beer and they do these wild fermentations and they do these sour beers and brett beers but i don't really get that vibe from at least from your website and i don't really think that that is necessarily the uh the sort of uh i don't know accurate depiction at least not anymore i mean the bottom line is we want people to feel comfortable drinking these beers right it's like yeah. it's like educational and we want people to like be curious. And I think we've all had that experience in a wine tasting room where it, where the, the, like the wine server behind the bar is like, Oh, you tasted this random thing that you've never actually tasted before in this wine. Right. And they make you kind of feel like an idiot. And it's just like, you know, we make, we, we put our heart and soul into these beers and they take a really long time and we, we love them and they're, they're elevated to a point with cool packaging and, and what they need to be on the table at Thanksgiving or whatever. But at the same time, we want to be grounded and, and like your enjoyment is yours, right? It's like, however you enjoy it is great. Is that part of the packaging? Is that a thought, a consideration that goes into p choosing your packaging? Cause your packaging is very cool, but it is very subtle at the same time. It's not, you know, flashy, like some of these, you know, canned, you know, hazy IPAs can get with like, here's, you know, iridescent uh, hyper color type labels that buzz and alert you whenever you open the can. Um, but it is still sort of a classic, a classic field. Do you, 
do you sort of feel like you have to have a, a sort of subdued branding so it fits alongside a nice bottle of wine or something else? Or do you just generally like the aesthetic of of that? Yeah, I think it's both. But like really for us, it's, it's about getting people to think about beer as something that, that can be, you know, at Thanksgiving or whatever. You can take it to somebody's house and, and like, you know, your aunt doesn't roll her eyes at you because you showed up with a six pack, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I brought something nice. It like is very food friendly, has some complexity to it. And, and part of that is, is, is the packaging. Part of it is like understanding, you know, that you get more aroma out of, out of a glass that has some shape to it. I mean, a, a lot of it is like, um, and, and my background comes a little bit more on the wine side, but, um, the wine industry has done such a great job of educating consumers on things like, you know, how you serve their wine and the beer industry is like, has been sort of dominated by a few giant companies for a long time that really didn't want you to taste their beer. Right. It was, it was about like, how cold can it be? And like, how fast can you drink it? <laughs> right. so, you can just say Russian river. It's fine. You can say it. <laughs> <laughs> so Vinny was encouraging you to chug your beers out of a frozen <laughs> shaker pint. Yeah, don't store Pliny. I need you to pound it in the par- the parking lot as soon as you buy it. Don't store this beer. Exactly, with the swift in the neck, right? To get it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, it's that, that line that we that we love to that we love to to mingle between kind of like the beer. Obviously, we make beer, and and it's it. We, but we also love that wine experience of like, you know, we have our tasting room out 20 miles south of town in wine country and we operate a lot. Like we love that experience with food and beverage and, and really kind of taking your time and slowing things down to really appreciate the things. But the, the balance is like doing that, but not being pretentious about it. And that's, that's what we try to do all the time. It's just like, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's elevate beer. Let's have this really cool process. Let's teach everyone about it. But Let's not be assholes about it at the same time. <laughs> well, and how how do you do that? Because you know, because you're right. You don't want to talk down to your customers. You don't want to assume that they either know more than they do, or sort of chide them or embarrass them because they know less than they think they do. How do you find that, especially in wine country, like you guys are saying, there is there is that sort of like wine tasting room element that you want to get away from, but you know, at the same time, it's you're you're still here to learn about the drink. Well, a big, a big piece for us, I think is, is that it is, you know, we're not trying to like put something in front of you and tell you what you should be tasting. Right. Like, I think that Brian alluded to that, but like, sometimes that's the most frustrating thing in a wine tasting room when they're like, Oh, this, you know, this was like green tobacco and forest floor. And you're like, you're like, wait a minute, what? Like, I, yeah. I'm not I, drinking I poo or tea. Like I, you know, what's going on. <laughs> and, and so you, you're kind of like, I didn't get any of those things. So like, am I an idiot? Like, do I not understand what's going on? And so for us, um, it's really about letting people experience it. You know, we talk about the process. We talk about like the story behind the beers. We do a ton of stuff with like uh, local fruit. We just released a beer last week that was um, co-fermented with Mirabelle plums grown literally 10 feet from our property. Um, so it's like super local um, and, and getting people to understand kind of like all the things that go into it, start to kind of see how you can pair this flavor or this acidity level with food and, and kind of put the experience together. But then it's like, what do you experience? And, and what do you like? I, one of the things that I hate is when somebody tells you like what you should like, right? If, if wow. you taste it and you're like, I'm not into that, it's like, okay. Try, try something else. Like yeah. you don't have to love X, Y, Z, hazy IPA or Imperial stout or whatever it is that everybody else says is awesome. It's like, you know, we'll, we'll give you something else to try. Yeah. I like that. I like that approach for sure. Because uh, that is definitely me. I'm very, I don't know, boxed in and I, I built this cage of emotions for myself about, <laughs> about what, to, what I like in, in beer. And sometimes it does me a disservice, you know, from going out. You're like, well, you know, when I used to go out uh, where it's like, oh, there's nothing on the list. I can I, I feel like I will enjoy. So then I'm just going to have a Dr. Pepper <laughs> or whatever, whatever it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's the fallback. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, kudos to, you know, for having a, a, a wide variety of, of different stuff. So you guys are, are primarily or, or solely barrel aging your beers, right? 100% barrel aged beer. 100%. Yeah. 
How did you get? Well, in- I should say aged, aged in some sort of wood. We have a handful of fooders as well. But oh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Wood aged. When did you guys open? How long have you been cranking out beers up there in Eugene? We quit our day jobs in two, end of 2015, and then we all started December 15, and then we released our first beers in August of 16. Yeah, summer of 16 at some point. Summer of 16. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so you weren't you weren't doing day jobs and then doing this as like a, you know, night shift kind of thing. You you took the leap. We committed, yeah. For better or worse, we committed. <laughs> How did your families think of what did your family think about that? Cuz you guys are brothers. Yeah. What I think, what, I think our parents, I don't know, Doug can attest to this too, but I think our parents were happy that we were getting along. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But All right. The best was every time my grand, I'd call my grandma on the phone, she'd be like, so have you got a real job yet? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, grandma, I have a real job. He was a huge <laughs> burn from grandma. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I had also like, so I lived in the Bay Area for a while and, and I had some real jobs, but before we started Ale Song, I had sort of a quarter life crisis and I lived in Colombia, like South America, Colombia. For four years so i think my family had given up on me already so it was fine so you snapped and moved to south america yeah exactly okay. <laughs> but, so then when i moved here people are like well at least that's not as bad as columbia <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay i bet that was a a culture shock to not only go down there but then come back it's like wow i mean things change in the bay area you know housing prices and you know probably yeah, well, 100 more coffee shops open since you left <laughs> for sure and like when i when i come back to visit my friends in San Francisco or, or wherever, it, it sort of blows my mind how different it was than it was 10 years ago, even. Yeah. Um, but obviously it still have Brian and I are from Truckee. Um, okay. So obviously Northern California has a special place in our hearts. Uh, our third business partners from uh, Iowa. So none of us are actually native Oregonians, but, but we all love Oregon for all of the reasons that, everybody else from California keeps moving here. So <laughs> yeah. Oregon that rules, just, that man. Just outed me. I, I never tell people I'm from California. <laughs> <laughs> we got a huge, uh, huge scoop right here. I really appreciate that. Thank you. It's all we're after here anymore. I yeah. really basically just feel like anything North of Shasta is Northern California. Maybe until you get up to Seattle and then that's the cutoff to like Washington. <laughs> Oregon is just Northern California. Oh man. So many Oregonians are just rolling their eyes at you right now. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. <laughs> no, I love Oregon, man. Oregon is like, it is funny because when you talk about visiting another, you know, another state like Oregon and you get the natives uh, sort of afraid you're going to move there. It just reminds me of, of that, like, uh, you know, don't come to Hawaii. You don't move to Hawaii because you're going to get beat up. And I feel like <laughs> Oregon is sort of the same way, but. But we're too <laughs> nice to beat you up. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say the opposite, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Some of the people from Oregon I know are a little bit loopy. Uh, no, Oregon rules, man. I, I love it. It's uh, it's a great place to visit. And, uh, you know, we were talking before the show where now it's basically just like California where it's hot as shit and on fire all the time. So it might as well just be absorbed into the state. <laughs> Those are fighting words, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's sort of what I do, though. Uh, the beer that I opened a little bit on the beginning of the show is Touch of Brett. It's a dry hopped farmhouse ale aged in French oak barrels. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about this beer as I pour it into my Mai Tai glass at the same time? Yeah, definitely. So this is actually one of the, uh, probably the closest thing, this and Rhino Suit are the closest things we have to flagships um, where we brew them more than once. Um, and this beer we brewed every year since we opened and uh, it's an awesome beer. So it's 100% Britannomyces fermented Saison uh that's aged in french oak and then bottle conditioned and it's always dry hops at the end before bottle conditioning and when we first did it it was the first beer we released um we were fortunate enough to win gold at jbf that for that very first beer we made which was pretty wow dope. and uh look at you guys the, and then the, we kept, the californians coming into oregon and winning gold already yeah and then we kept uh kept making it and we we switched up the hop the dry hop for a few years and then we kind of just went back to the og because we liked it so much so this is dry hop to citra Citra. And kind of going forward, we're just going to be dry hopping with Citra on this. But um, it's definitely a, a very, uh, it's kind of the gateway beer to barrel aged beers, we feel like, because it's very, you know, it's it's not super acidic. It's it's the the Brett level is is not, I mean, it's 100% Brett fermented. So it's not, 
you know, there's not no Brett, obviously, but but the way that we <laughs> ferment our Brett really, really harnesses kind of the tropical aspects of Brett. And then um, as opposed to like the super funky barnyardy. Um, so, and it's kind of the hoppiest beer we make at what, like, I don't know, 20 IBUs or something, but the, uh, this is kind of our gateway for people that are like, oh, I love IPAs. What, what should we drink? And then we hand them this, but um, it's a, it's a fun beer that we've done over and over again. And it's, it's, uh, I don't know, done well for us. It's, it's super food friendly too, I think, which is, which is really awesome. You you can put it with a lot of different things. Um, and to give a little bit of, of our roles here, Brian kind of runs production here. And so he's probably a little more modest about this stuff, but this beer has won four out of five years of GABF. It's one of metal. Wow. Um, so we're yeah, very proud of this one. I would be too. That's, a, I mean, God. That's a whole show right there <laughs> on that topic specifically, because that is an incredibly hard thing to do, obviously. And, uh, you know, I know you're not making beer specifically to win awards, but it is nice to be, you know, to be rewarded with an award on what you're doing, especially in a place like GABF. Yeah, for that's sure. Tough, man, congrats. Very, on you guys. That's really humbling being there. Very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also like, as, as we were talking about just a minute ago, how everything's getting hotter. Um, yeah. All of our beers are kind of a sense of terroir of where we are in Eugene and, and kind of our place. And this one, this touch of Brett this year's is a little more acidic than previous years. And that's really just just 100% due to our cellar is hotter and our bottle conditioning room is hotter than it ever has been in the past. So so like souring bacteria is able to kind of kick in a little more. So it's really interesting that, you know, we when I say we make this every year and same with our rhino soup beer or a couple of our other beers that we reproduce, we're not trying to, to make the exact same beer every time. It's more of like the vintage approach. So it's like this touch of bread is going to be different than the next year is going to be different than the next year. And this one is really kind of a, what stands out in my mind is being like, Oh wow. It was really hot when we were bottle conditioning this beer and is really this, hot when we were cellaring this beer. So is it's this like, like a, the rest. is this like a, a marker for things to come? Are you, are you sort of like, Oh, you're touching cloth right now. Like what, like if this beer is different because it's hotter, how is everything going to shift? And, and, and are you, how are you going to be approaching that? Yeah, I think more so as we're like, you know, looking at intervening and getting some temperature control in the warehouse. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, that we don't have now. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's just, it's just, you know, this year has been, we had, I don't know, 10 days or something over a hundred this summer, which we just never get in Eugene. And it, it was just like our, um, our warehouse in town where our bottling line is and our, our, our cages are where we bottle condition our beer is, is just a super rudimentary, like not insulated warehouse. And, you know, the, when the beers were bottle conditioning, they got way hotter than they normally get. So, you know, we're kind of looking at, at transitioning to, you know, moving facilities and, and getting some temperature control and things that we never had to think about before because that wasn't an issue. Yeah. You were just on autopilot and then now right, exactly. the environment decides to make you work a little bit harder. Yeah. And that's, that's what happens. You, you said a little bit, uh, Brian, about how you ferment your Brett to drive specific characters. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I love, I hang out with a handful of winemakers and they all roll their eyes at me because I, I love Britannomyces yeah. um, or American winemakers, I should say. And <laughs> right. the biggest thing is that if you, if you, if you find Britannomyces in wine, um, that's, that's the most stressed out that that yeast will ever be. Cause it's just a high alcohol environment. It's an acidic environment and it's super, super low cell count. So Britannomyces in wine is really like band aid to me and very like really far on the funk, like not even fun, but just kind of not great spectrum. Yeah. And basically to, to come off with these really tropical and citrus forward flavors, um, you do the opposite of that. So it's, 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 you, you, you have really healthy, healthy yeast that you pitch during primary fermentation at very, very high pitch rates. So we're, we're pitching at like above lager pitch rates for these. You ferment at a cool ish temperature for Brett. I mean, we're fermenting at like 66 degrees and then you're, you're really kind of giving it everything it needs to thrive as a yeast strain. So you're, you're, you're seeing like the best of Brett as opposed to just like it's struggling to survive and creating all these kind of gnarly off flavors, which, you know, those, I shouldn't be so harsh with those off flavors. Like some of those, you know, some of those things we, you know, you kind of expect in, in lambic, and, lambic beers or lambic inspired beers. 
um, you, you expect kind of that, that funky barnyard hay type aromas and flavors. But yeah. um, for our primary fermented beers that are 100% Brett, it's like we want just like the best, the best that Brett can be, if you will. <laughs> and, uh, and that's just like kind of treating it like you would a normal brewer's yeast. And it really comes off tropical and citrus forward, which we really enjoy. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Because, you know, when we were still learning about using Brett in beers, especially on the, on the homebrew level, it was stress them out. Right. Under pitch, stress it out, really drive those flavors. But you're like, you're saying you get more funk than tropical. You get more farmhouse than tropical and the hay and that light hay, honey thing and whatever. But, and that's there a little bit, but there is that tropical fruit, you know, green guava kind of a, a thing happening here that that is very different. And, and that's because you're using it as an ale yeast, basically. I mean, that's totally. Yeah. Okay. And when we talk about like how much we love this beer as kind of a gateway beer for people. Yeah. Um, so many of our customers are not super beer nerds that are looking for a really like intense, funky bread for men. It's people that are like enjoying our experience. They're, they're intrigued by kind of this, this higher end packaging and this higher end product. And this may be their first experience with any sort of mixed culture beer. And so I don't know that they're always going to love some of those kind of more intense Brett flavors, right? Whether it's kind of like the, the diesel or the Band-Aid or like the intense barnyard. Um, and so this one is, is really intended to be very food friendly and very um, kind of approachable for a lot of palates. That surprises me, I guess, because knowing you're from Eugene and, and Oregon in general, I, I just sort of assume that every customer and every brewery in Oregon is just high on the spectrum of beer nerds where they're just like, they're looking for the exact thing you're offering or whatever. And it's, I, I, it's, I don't know what it is, but I, I, I have to remember that that's not the case that there are still new people coming into beer. I'm sort of like, you know, it's like that thing where like, it's hard for people to listen to music that they, after like high school, you know, where you're like, you're always listening back to the same music you sort of like listened to before. It's sort of like that with people entering the beer scene. I, for me, it's like, oh, I forget that there's actually new people who don't know anything, who are just looking for a new, a new type of beer to brew. And, and we're in, in wine country and, and we get a ton of crossover from wineries and wine consumers who like, who like food and, and wine and and higher end experiences and they'll come in and they'll be like, we love the vibe here. Like, what is it that you're presenting for us? They're like, Oh, I'm not normally a beer drinker, but when you can put something in front of them that you're like, Oh, this has like a white wine level acidity and it's got some fruit character. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, crazy. This is beer. And, and you can kind of like introduce somebody to something new. And, and for us, it, it's, it's never been about being like this super extreme, niche like we're only targeting people who are really into beer it's been about like how many people can we introduce to a really awesome product i i want to add on that that uh in oregon the the beer scene has like because we grow some of the best hops in the country the beer scene here has been super super hop forward so there was a lot of time where it was like you know if you don't drink IPAs and of course we all remember IPAs 10 15 years ago were like oh how bitter can we get this thing yeah. so a lot of a lot of beer that people had were like they had Bud Light and they had super super hoppy West Coast IPA and they're like oh from those two data points we don't like beer and so we get a ton of people in and they're just like oh we don't like beer and then we give them one of our, our sour fruit beers or, or or something like that and they're like whoa I had no idea that beer could taste like this and because you know we make great IPAs in the Northwest but almost to a fault where we're like, oh, what, you don't like IPA? Then that means you don't like beer. So we're, we're kind of that, I don't know, the amount of people that come into the tasting room that are just like stoked that, that they, they have something and they've never tasted the, those flavor profiles before. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Because yeah, I mean, as good as IPA is for, uh, for the economy of craft beer, it is sort of like, like you said, one person's data point of beer. This is beer, I don't like it. Right, this is craft beer, and then American Light Lager is not craft beer, and I don't like either of those, so therefore I don't like any beer. Yeah, and that's the hard part about going to beer bars is because they have to make money, and so right. you know you have seventeen taps and fourteen are IPAs, and then the rest are hazy IPAs, and you're like, well, I can't, I don't know, or like here's a a seven percent porter, you're like, right. well, <laughs> that's not really going to do it for me. So 
give me my Dr. Pepper, no ice. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. It's, it's, it's weird, man. The, the, the business of craft beer is, is definitely weird, but the cool part is there's something for everybody. You just have to go and find it sometimes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Which is why I love doing shows like this, uh, you know, that, that aren't really just here are, you know, here's our pale ale and here's our, you know, uh, porter or whatever. It's, it's, they're, they're, they're different. They're, it, it sort of reminds you of the, the canvas, the palette of flavors that beer actually has. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So I, I appreciate you guys being on the show and, and talking. Thanks about for having that. us. Yeah. Um, I tell you what, let's just open another beer. What do you think of that? How about, uh, you were saying stone fruit symphony. Yeah. Right. Let me find that. Tell me a little about that. Uh, while I dig through my cooler here. Um, so a lot of our, um, I don't know, we, we try super hard to, to, to really just align ourselves with awesome people doing awesome things in their craft. Right. So we have, uh, this beer has some peaches that were grown just a few miles north of our, of our, uh, of our brewery by some friends of ours. And then it's also um, the nectarines came from the Hood River area, but it was via a local company that is called Organically Grown Company that really is like a farmer owned cooperative that that really helps um, organic uh, farmers come and, and like really get their get their stuff to 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 market. Um, so it's wow. we try really hard to focus with local farmers. And we, we're spoiled that we can do that in the Willamette Valley. Um, and this beer is a just a testament to that, that um, these are two awesome fruit varietals that uh, we grow very well here in the Willamette Valley and, and we can get from our friends. Um, but kind of to, to paint a really broad brush with our, with our fruit beers, that all of our beers, I'll get kind of into the production side, all of our beers are fermented, primary fermented in stainless steel where we pitch our mixed culture. Um, it's in stainless steel for about a month and then it goes down into oak for three or four months. And then our fruit beers get uh that four four three four month old beer goes back on the fruit referments on that fruit and then goes back into barrel to finish maturing uh before it's blended in bottle condition so okay. you know these beers are uh you know over over a year to be to be very general um in production wise and this is a you know it's kind of one of those things that's all hands on deck we actually just got pluots nectarines and peaches yesterday that kind of all hands on deck tomorrow. We're all going to be cutting and deep hitting and throwing into our fooders to oh, that sounds fun. Fun. so it's kind of a <laughs> team building, if you will. Yep. <laughs> building um, building your next day at work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You want to be here tomorrow? Come stone fruit or de but, but there's a big difference, right? Like you smell this beer and and it it smells like fresh stone fruit, right? This doesn't smell like somebody dumped something out of a bag into a fermenter. No. It's, it, it's a like ripe whole stone fruit thing and, and you can you can really taste the difference and smell the difference and we believe pretty strongly that fruit matters i think this is something that like every winemaker will tell you that fruit is a big deal and in the beer industry a lot of people are like well yeah you got raspberries right and you're like well were they good raspberries were they shitty raspberries were they whole raspberries like does it right what was the sugar content what was the acid level what was like all those things that we we really care about and it's like no they were just raspberries and this you're like wait a minute they're like, just raspberries you know? yeah well right and you know what and that's a good point about you, you need to know the acid level as we all know shopping raspberries or even blueberries i mean you know blueberries they don't really taste like much but you can either have like an overripe blueberry or just a shitty blueberry or one that's really good same with cherries or whatever. So what are you putting in your beer? So do you guys, you guys test the acidity and treat it like a, like a, a wine, I would imagine. Yeah. That so the more, wine. the more, uh, the more techie farmers that we work with will, uh, I'll work directly with them. So, so next door is King State Winery, which is one of the biggest wineries in Oregon. And they, um, are fully biodynamic and, and do a ton of really cool farming practices, but uh, in addition to growing grapes, they grow a handful of other things. And speaking of blueberries, we just got blueberries in a few weeks ago. Nice. And because they're set up with a with the wine um, with their wine process lab, we get we get like TA and sugars and and tannin levels um, and nitrogen uh, levels from them. So that really helps us like dial in the harvest. And we'll we'll like because we can work with them so directly. It's like, hey, let's harvest the fruit at uh, 
like at this point and then we wait and we harvest it at that point and that's that's definitely spoils us for the fruit that we get from them yeah for sure <laughs> on the other side of yeah <laughs> on the other side of things uh like the small farmers a lot of it is just on pallet right so it's like they would normally pick it super early underwrite uh to go to the market so that all the shipping and everything happens and then it sits on the the market of choice counter or the you know the safeway counter or whatever and then it it ripens there so you can take it home a month after it's picked um so the local farmers here we can work with them and be like look let's get it like pretty ripe um sugar levels pretty high before we pick it because we'll go into beer the next day and then on the the when we're working with people that are a little further away that i don't have the luxury of just like going there and tasting it firsthand um what we'll do is we'll have it come in in house and then we we will lay them out in their bins um and and wait until they ripen to the level that we want okay. in, before we put them into the beer so yeah, it's, it's very it's still very like no matter how we get them or no matter how we work with the farmer, we'd be like, no, that we can get the fruit to a certain level before we want to use it in the beer. You are spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that something you guys, do you, you think that you would have stumbled upon or a practice that you would have implemented had you not been in the Willamette Valley in wine country like that? Like if you were in Truckee? Oh yeah. I like think if you're in Truckee, that definitely would not have been the case, but yeah. we can make an IPA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure yeah it's just like um i mean that's why i i, I love it here so much like i i left trucky came to u of o um in eugene and then got my degree in chemistry and actually the, the class that stuck with me the most and i'm still like one of one of like three professors i'm still in contact with at u of o is the urban farm professor that like it was this like agriculture class and learning about you know obviously everything agriculture and and uh and that's why I love it in Eugene so much is because we have such a cool, like cool food scene where pretty much everyone has a garden in their backyard and they're growing their own food. They're canning their own food. Yeah. We have an awesome restaurant scene that uses all, all of these like great small organic producers of, of fruits and vegetables. Um, and we're able to just, and everyone loves, like everyone loves the craft and everyone's super stoked on it. And we all know we're not getting rich doing it, but we all like, like helping each other out. So it's, yeah. it's this really cool vibe that we have here and, and, you know, that's why, that's why I'm here. And that's why I drug Doug from South America up here. <laughs> this. So it's, you were the one who put him back together. Yeah. You brought so him it, whole up to the, you know, back to, <laughs> I don't know. Right. So it was, you know, that's, that's a huge plus of being here. And I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, my backyard is full of vegetables right now. And this is like the most exciting time at the brewery. Cause we're like, okay, what fruit's coming in now? What's fruit comes in now? It's like blueberries were a couple of weeks ago and stone fruits this week. And then in a couple of weeks we have all the um, wine grape beer or like, you know, wine grapes. And we're like, this is just such a cool, like vibrant side of the brewing industry where we can, where we're really going off agriculture at its core, because before that it's like, sure, we're an agricultural product, but you know, we're buying, you know, mass produced grain and sacks. And, and, you know, when we're lucky, we can go meet our hop growers and in the Northwest, we're spoiled to do that as well, where we go meet our hop growers and can like pick hop lots and things like that. But you know, we've brewing is, has gone away for the most part from being like a truly agricultural product. Um, and, you know, I, it really excites me to kind of get back to that point where we can work with local growers and, and it's really a, a sense of place for us, right? It's like, this is stone fruit symphony is, is stone fruit that grew in the Willamette Valley in 2020. Like that's, that's, you know, that's what it is. And it's never going to be like that again. It's going to be different each year, but that's, that's what it is. And it's really exciting to be able to showcase that. Yeah. The, the aroma from the, 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 the peaches and the nectarines are, they're blended really well because you get the peach underneath. And, you know, for me, like peaches are, uh, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but like they're a darker stone fruit aromatics than nectarines. Nectarines are sort of like lighter and more uh, acidic smelling. I don't, you know, don't question it. Just that's how, <laughs> that's how my brain works right now. But it's like, I get the nectarines, but the peaches still carry underneath. And then you get some of that malt, I think underneath as well, all of that. And it's just this great structure for all these aromatics. And, and Doug, you're right. This is very much like just a fresh, like cracking open a fresh peach and then rubbing it with a nectarine and then smelling that. Because everyone does that, I imagine. You know, you take two and you make one, and that's how you... Yeah, that's what I do every time I go into the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, sir, what are you doing? I'm rubbing on my peach and my nectarine together. <laughs> exactly. Give me some space. This is a very private moment. 
Yeah, it's great, man. And then that acidity comes through. Uh, it's very bright smelling sour beer. Yeah, I could just, this is one of these beers that I could just sit and, and sniff all day long. They and when you start talking great. to people about like how things pair with food and you, and you imagine that with like some sort of a soft cheese and you're like, man, that would be so refreshing on like a hot summer day. And I don't know, it's just like, it's pretty fun to start to bring that food element into, into the beer world because so much of it, it has been ignored on that side. You know what I, I fully appreciate about this beer and I think, and I forgive me. I was so excited. I, I I forgot to even talk about the touch of Brett, but we can always go back to it. Um, is is the, the sort of depth of character that your beers have? You know, sometimes you get Brett beers or sour beers or you know uh, mixed culture fermentations where they're not really they're sort of linear. Um, but this these I haven't noticed that. You know, there is there is a dynamic to it. There is a, a complexity to it. And then even though through the, the malt, like the malt will, will carry through after the fruit and everything sort of blends together at the end. And then it's bright and acidic and it's gone. You, I, I still get a little peachy nectarine thing, but the beer just is, is very refreshingly finished. It stays behind a little bit, but not much. And it's, it's not overly complex. It's not complicated, which I don't think that's what you want. You don't want to over overcomplicate things for your consumer, but it's a very, very approachable fruited sour beer. I really like this beer a lot. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think one of the other things too, and I, I don't know if this is is kind of what you were meaning or not, but so much of, of of what we see in the beer industry with a lot of beers right now is like very one dimensional, like I am trying to like make you a peach beer. And so all you are going to taste is peaches. Mm -hmm. And what we want is a balance of peaches and acidity and malt character and yeast character and like the whole package. And so, so trying to be balanced with everything where people will take another sip and be like, Oh, I tasted something I didn't taste last time. And then they take another sip and they're like, man, I really want another glass of this. Like to us, that's super important. Like if, if we fill up your glass, and you have one taste and you're like, that's amazing, but I don't want another sip. Like, right. Checked it in. I'm done. <laughs> we failed. <laughs> like, Checked it in. Like, that's not the goal. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so much like, like just another element of what Doug said. It's just like so many beers are, are, are just hit you over the head. And then there's, there's like, oh man, this is so sour. Or this is, and you know, as most sour beer breweries, um, we've gone through that, that like, oh, our beers aren't very sour. And then we went too sour. And now we've kind of come back. Um, and, and for us, it's just like, I don't know, every beer that we make is just, we focus so much to, to quote Budweiser on drinkability. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like our beers are in 500 mil bottles. Like, yeah, that's two eight ounce pours for you and your friend or 16 ounces to yourself. And I want you to be able to drink the 16 ounces to yourself. Cause it's like, you're not going to get, you know, the, the enamel ripped off your teeth or you're not going to have so much sugar in one of our stouts that, you know, you're going to have diabetes after drinking it. So it's like, yeah, for sure. Like well, I, I don't, I don't want a hole to be eaten through in my stomach and then it just comes out right. <laughs> afterwards. Right. And I, I mean, I, either one of these, I would be totally uh, content drinking by myself. They're great. Yeah. yeah they're, they're really good. I, uh, yeah. So you said that you sort of went too sour and then you came back. How do you, how do you pull back from the acidity and the sourness and sort of bring it back in line? How do you even make that call? So what's really interesting is actually um, I'm in the weeds so much that I, I don't notice a lot of the big picture things. And that's what's great to have Doug okay. on board here is because he, he can come through and, and kind of get me out of the weeds. Okay. Um, yep. But there was like, I don't know, a few years back when we were kind of growing a bit and all of a sudden our beers started tasting way better and better. Doug was like, hey, do you think this is because we have way more beer in our cellar that we can blend with? And it was just kind of the like, that's exactly why. Mm -hmm. Like we have you know, now that instead of, and that's kind of what separates us from other breweries too, is that they're just doing wild beers or barrel aged beers on the side is that, you know, we've got during the seasons, the most of our spirits program is like 300 casks. And, and in our wild program, there's over 200 casks. And it's like, wow. you know, we have a lot to choose from when we want to come up with a blend. And that has really, really made our beer better. And, you know, I guess being able to go through and, you know, all of us and now our team has gotten bigger. We have Huck and, and 
uh, who's like lead seller man, and then Joe's our new lead brewer, and Matt, our third business partner, was the founding brewmaster. He's brewmaster at Oakshire, and now he's mm. he started with us. Um, and you know, we all get together and we come up with these blends, and it's like it's really nice to have some two sour beer in the cellar that we can blend in to up acidity, or we have some super mild Brett Saison that we can up in to like lower acidity and build mouthfeel. Um, so it's really just like having more colors on our palette and a bigger cellar that we can, you know, we can work with. And, and yeah. I was so much just being like in the weeds, like, oh yeah, our beer is getting better and better. And Doug's like, yes, yeah, because we have more beer in the cellar. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but there's, it's a huge thing, right? Like you, every, I don't want to say every, but like so many small breweries, dabble in barrel aging right i don't want to say we're the only people doing this because we're certainly not but one of the big advantages we have is that when we go in to make a blend we've got 300 casks to choose from and we can guide that the way that we want to to have some consistency where if you're like oh this is our once a year anniversary beer and so we put like we filled four wine barrels with our sour beer and we're going to see how it turns out like sometimes it's going to be really good and sometimes it's not, but you have no control over it at that point because there's nothing else you can do. And so for us, it's like we're super fortunate now that we have, again, we're a tiny brewery. I think we did like 500 beer barrels of beer last year. But in terms of barrel aged beer, that's like kind of a lot. And so to be able to like go through your cellar and have tasks that you can be like, cool, like Brian said, we're going to throw in some Saison here and like up the mouthfeel and the body um, and reduce the acidity, like being able to kind of redirect a little bit after the fact is super important to making a balanced beer. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good, that's a good card to play when you're building a beer. Um, let's take a break real fast. We'll come back and we'll drink some more beers. So, uh, hang on everybody (laughs) into the session. We're here with the boys from ale song up in Eugene, Oregon. We're going to be popping more corks here on the session. We'll be right back. All right, thanks for sticking around, everybody. We are back with the boys from Ale Song up in Eugene, Oregon. And Brian, we were talking a little bit uh, before before we came back during the break. Uh, our friend Barry from Lucky Envelope was commending you on your uh, MBAA, which I believe is the Master Brewers Association. Yep. Something like that. Um, about your talk on barrel-aged beers. And you were saying that that was a very intimidating <laughs> and sort of humbling experience. What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was just, it was really cool because, you know, a ton of the people that I've idealized in the industry and locally were, were out there like listening to me give a talk about what we make. And it was just, I don't know, very humbling. And and I really got the idea to start this project, listening, uh, listening to Paul Ernie give a talk on barrel aged beer at NBAA. Mm -hmm. And it felt like he was just speaking to me the whole time because, um, I guess before this in college, I had a, uh, I kind of scanned my way into an, into an internship for credit at Oakshire Brewing here in Eugene. There you go. Um, and that's where I met Matt, our third uh, business partner. Okay. Um, he was the brewmaster there. And I was getting my degree in chemistry and um, kind of approached them being like, hey, I could do some like analytics for you guys. Let's, let's you know, maybe I'll start a quality program, whatever. Um, and it was like, as Matt likes to put it, like the craft beer bug kind of bit me and I was just like done forever that this is what I wanted to do. Okay. Um, and, and after college, I continued working there as their quality control manager and then started to run their cellar. And then, and then Matt was really, um, he's from uh, the Midwest and he brewed at, at Flossmore Station among others. He's gonna get mad at me that I don't remember everywhere that he brewed, but uh, <laughs> Flossmore Station was the big one. All where right. he won a uh, small brewer of the year at, at GABF. And he would, him and Todd Ashman were kind of the first guys to like really put beer in barrels. Mm-hmm. Um, so he had a, he had a barrel program at Oakshire and I, I helped him uh, do that. And it was always kind of like nights and weekends. We would like have enough space in the production brewery to make barrel aged beer. And otherwise I was just constantly checking seams on cans of IPA and making sure that like all our full distribution beers there were, were you know, up to standards. And at this NBA talk, uh, Paul Arney was just like um, from Ale Apothecary. He was formerly into shoots, and he was basically giving this talk about like I think his tagline was "Art over industry," and it was like you get sick of making the same. You know, it's not corporate beer, right? Kind of because we're not AB and Bev, but you get you get sick of making the same beer over and over again. Like like let's get back to our roots of agriculture and and, and just like the, the craft of all these things. And I felt like he was just speaking to me the whole time at this NBA <laughs> meeting. 
He was. And, uh, and it was shortly after that, that I was like, you know what, we got to do this. I, uh, talked Doug into coming back from South America to helping us. And then I talked Matt into leaving his very, um, good and safe position as brewmaster at Oakshire to come do this as well. And, and, uh, it was just kind of a full circle thing to be able to be at NBAA giving a similar talk that Paul Arnie did, uh, <laughs> That convinced me to leave <laughs> to start nail sawing. <laughs> Paul in the audience by chance? <laughs> Probably not. Knowing <laughs> Paul, <laughs> just sitting back there, and then you're done, and he starts slow clapping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Paul's good. His beers are great. We had him on a couple of years ago. Yeah, beers are yeah. fantastic. Uh, all right, I'm gonna crack open the Terroir Project, spontaneously fermented sour ale with Pinot Noir grapes. What is, uh, what is this? Because you guys, the Willamette Valley is the Pinot. That's what you guys are sort of known for. Is it Pinot or is it Petit Syrah? Pinot, for sure. Pinot, okay. All right. I get those two confused in my head all the time. Yeah, Willamette Valley Classic. So tell me a little bit about the Terroir Project, please. Yeah, so the... Um, you want this? Yeah, I mean, so, so this is like Firestone Walker organizes kind of a multi-brewery collab every year um where it's they've invited i don't know a, a dozen breweries um that do mixed culture uh beers and kind of co-ferments with wine grapes to do this project that they call the terroir project because it's really about showcasing the terroir of where you're from and for those of you who aren't from a snobby wine background like i am the uh <laughs> terroir is like the capturing the time and the place and the in the soil and really the character of that moment and that place. Um, and so the way that this um, collaboration is set up and there's a festival every fall, or at least there used to be until last fall, uh, but there's a festival every year where, where these dozen breweries or so all come together and showcase the terroir of their brewery and their area uh, with these beers. But basically everybody makes the same base beer and that has to be 51% of the fermentables. And then 49% of the fermentables come from wine grapes grown within, I think, 100 miles of your brewery. Uh, we didn't really struggle with the distance at all. I think some of the guys, Jester King in Texas has a little bit harder time finding a, uh, a nearby <laughs> a winery. But mm -hmm. we literally have one that's like 100 feet away, so we could go there. But we had, we had so many to choose from. And this one, this year, uh, the one that you have in front of you, we made with one of our... Um, Kind of closest partners in the wine industry antiquum farm they're all it, it's just like an amazing farm to winery um it's grazing based agriculture where they kind of operate and you know they rotate the different livestock through their their vineyard you know when they need to kind of turn over the soil they let the pigs come in and they root around and and turn over the soil and then when they need to fertilize a little bit the chickens come in and I don't know all the details on it, but they make some amazing wine and amazing grapes. And so these, these are the grapes that we used in this one. Um, Brian spent a little bit of time actually working on the production side in the wine industry before we started Ale Song to get a little bit of background about the way wineries do um, a lot of production, treat barrels and all the other things that breweries are still learning. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. And so he can probably tell you a little bit more about the way we treated the fruit, but this is like, you know as much wine as it is beer and, and it's just like a super cool kind of like mind fuck to some degree of like what am i drinking here yeah I mean, <laughs> it really is man it's yeah, like a carbonated but, sangria but i mean not on that not on that flavor level but it is like <laughs> am i drinking wine am i drinking watered down wine am i what it what 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 am i what am i doing yeah, there's some cool sparkling I'm... sparkling reds from uh, argentina that are, are similar but that's a digression the um the other thing too is that we we've made um so matt and i started making wine beers at at oakshire with some mueller thurgau grapes and i don't know nine eight eight years ago and yeah. that was kind of our first foray into the into making wine beers and, and that was like that was probably the moment in beer making that i was like i'm in this is it um, and that just like really grabbed me as like this, the cool flavors you could get from fermenting wine grapes or grape juice, um, and, and what they could do to beer. And so we've made, we've made a, a, a ton of wine grape beers, both at, uh, some at Oakshire and then a ton here at Ale Song. Um, and we're really just like 
I don't know. Doug always gives me a hard time. He always is like, yeah, you wish you were a winemaker, but uh, <laughs> I think maybe a little, but yeah. I mean, it is sort of like, um, uh, I don't know. It's like when a brewer walks in versus like a winemaker, it's almost like winemakers are like when Fabio walks in, you know, the <laughs> hair is instantly blowing and the, you yeah, know, the like, okay. job, it, it basically like, Doug, yeah. And it's like, but like beer makers like, well, I got my, my Dickies work shirt on and uh, I'm just exactly. here for some fucking <laughs> fish and chips, but it is. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But the, um, so we've done a ton of, of, of cool, great beers with, you know, Cab Sauv grown in Washington, Horse and Hills area, obviously a ton of Pinot Noir from around here, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, uh, we've done Muscat, um, and they all just lend super cool characters to, to beer. And, um, the, uh, Antiquum is just North of us here in Eugene, they're in Junction city. And they are like probably one of the coolest farm wineries I've, I've ever, I've ever seen. And I really, I really got introduced to them when I was working at King State on the production team there. And we were buying a ton of fruit from all over the valley because they were, uh, you know, King of State's one of the biggest wineries in Oregon or the biggest winery in Oregon. And they're next door to us at our, at our brewery. And it was probably like two, three weeks after all the Pinot Noir in the state had come in. We got these like, I don't know, six bins of, of fruit from this random farm called Antiquum that I had never heard of and close to here. And it was just like, it looked like California Pinot. I mean, it was dark red. It was it was just like vibrant and there was no, I mean, there was like just nothing wrong with the fruit that you could ever see there. I mean, there was like wow. no bacteria problems. There was no insect problems. There's nothing. I was just like, what on earth is this like amazing fruit that just came in? Perfect um, fruit dropped down from the heavens, man. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. And then, and then throughout the process of making that wine, it was just like, it really stood out in the cellar. It stood, everything stood out so different than anything mm-hmm. we people grew here in Oregon. Um, and I was just kind of like, I need to meet these guys. This is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and as, as Doug said, they're all grazing based viticulture, which is like, it, you know, speaks to me too, as, as, as getting back to the roots of agriculture. I mean, they do everything totally different than any winery. They, they're, you know, their goats are running free through their vineyard. Their pigs are, you know, I mean, it's just like, it's just really intimate space of, of, of figuring out like what's the best way to treat grapes in our area. And how can we do that using the, 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 the least amount of mechanics and chemistry as possible. And yeah. they've come up with this program that's just fantastic. And, and when we got invited to do the terroir project, it was, that was like the first one that came to mind. It was like, these guys, these, they're the definition of terroir of the one in the Valley. This is the coolest thing we can do. Um, so we partnered with them and, and they're great friends. And we've, we've done some cool dinners with them where, you know, that's one of our favorite things. Just a little aside is to do a, uh, pairing dinners where we have like a beer and a wine for each course. And then there's like the, the competition of what paired better, the wine or the beer. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, for sure. That's it's cool. The beer carbonation gives us the, you know, gets us over the finish line usually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but in making these red, specifically red, red, great, uh, red wine beer hybrids is, is we treat this exactly like you would treat a, a wine. I mean, it's, it's in an open fermenter. We do punch downs on the cap. So as the, as the, as the beer ferments, it pushes all the grapes to the surface and then you punch that down. So it doesn't go uh, anaerobic. Um, you do that until it's dry. This is after a cold soak. Um, and, and you just, we're treating it exactly like we would treat Pinot Noir, except it's 51%, you know, malt fermentables as opposed to all grape fermentables. So it's, and then we bottle condition it and, and, you know, serve it cold and carbonated, but it's, it's a cool, very cool. Do you sulfide it first or were you sort of going for like the natural fermentation? Yeah. So this was all spontaneous on this and, and all of our fruit beers for that matter are, you know, we don't, we rinse, we rinse off as many bugs as we can and we yeah. rinse off. Um, you know, we try to get as many leaves and things out as we can, but uh, it's really just a, you know, we want, we want the native native flora that's on the fruit, any fruit that we use to impact the beer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is this is a, a like Doug said. This is a sort of a mind fucky beer. Yeah, because it's like it's 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 it's. I go, it's a wine, and then it changes. It it changes constantly. And I think Doug, you even brought that up on the last segment where your your beers you can pull different stuff at different times depending on either how how long it sits or a little bit maybe how warm it's getting or just in your palate, the way your palate shifts from sip to sip, your, your, your beers sort of do 
shift and, and change a little bit. Things do come to the forefront and then pull back a little bit. And uh, I wouldn't say things are fighting. They're not competing to come out, but they just, it's, it is sort of like this tide. It's like rolling tide of flavors. Yeah. This is a weird beer because I've had <laughs> wine beers before that sort of are like, I don't know. It's like, just tastes like oxidized wine and, and <laughs> put fucking beer in it. Like, I don't really care, but this, it doesn't taste like that at all. And I, and I think again, like I made this point earlier, but the fruit matters. So you're not like, Oh, we just got some Pinot Noir grapes. It's like, no, we got really good Pinot Noir grapes. And yes, they, they were expensive. But it, it's incredibly it's, expensive. It's totally <laughs> worth it. Right. Like, yeah it makes a big difference to have good fruit. Yeah. Well, and Willamette Valley Pinot is great. It's expensive. There's a reason for it. You know, I like the sort of farm based uh, wineries too. I mean, we've had a lot of the showroom wineries before, especially in, in California, especially in Napa Valley, but I'm sure you guys had your fill in Oregon too. And yeah, definitely. there are a couple of little holdouts, little standouts of they're just more, farms with grapes or you know or grapes with farms but that symbiotic relationship between between the animals and the earth and and you know sort of getting hippy dippy here a little bit but like and, and just how all that sort of connects and i think if you're caring for animals and you're caring for the grapes those things sort sort of go together somehow i don't really figure it out it's magic i don't know what it is i think it's just the mindset of the grower right if, if the grower yeah. is like i really want to focus on on like how these things play together and and, and like let's let's harness the best thing that comes off the land as opposed to just like forcing it via chemicals or whatever it's just going to create a better product because they're more like they're more passionate about growing the fruit and making the wine than they are about you know let's maximize the tons per acre that we can get on this and, and all that side so it's just yeah it's just a totally different mindset it's like process i think maybe to bastardize something you just said it was like process over profit right yeah, right. whatever you uh, whatever. Our industry, the Paul Arnie, <laughs> yeah, Paul Arnie, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, whatever, it's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And we you know if you're thinking about if you're thinking about your process and how to clean, and this goes to home brewing too, I mean, you know, probably especially. But if you're thinking about your process and how clean you are, and you know, and and in the enjoyment, but just how everything works together, rather than winning a competition. Right. You're going to have a better time and I think you're going to produce a better beer and 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 the same thing goes for for you know sour projects for wine for anything that you're making for food all that matters your process matters and it it, it just matters. Right. And it's 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 deciding whether to make a beer like on the homebrew level do I want to make a beer that hits the style guideline of BJCP exactly or do I want to make the beer that I want to drink? And it's right. like that's the that's the difference is you're like you know, you're going to be way more soaked on the other thing. Then. Yes. And if you make a beer that you want to drink and you enter it in competitions, that is your excuse when you fucking lose. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, at least I like it. And that's my yeah. problem. I go, well, look, I, you know, I'm making my oatmeal stout. It tastes more like a fucking brown porter. I don't care. I like it. That's why I haven't won. I mean, that's just it. It's not, yeah, it's not a category. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fine. And you wedge it in there somehow. Yeah, this is a rad beer, man. I, I really, uh, I almost feel um, uh, like I'm incorrect calling it a beer. It rides that line very, very well yeah. between wine and beer. It really does. It's, it's uh, how do people like this? How, how does your, your consumer base react to something like this? I almost feel like it's, you know, a little bit of like farting in church in the wine country where you're like, what it carbonated beer, well, wine <laughs> beer thing. What is this? Uh, I think, I think our, again, this is one of those things that when somebody comes into our tasting room and says they don't like beer, they only like wine. We'll give them this. And they'll be like, Oh wait, this is beer. Okay. What else do you have? I feel like that's cruel, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I think oh, it's also, oh, you know, this, this was a smaller beer, it mostly went to our beer club. Um, in fact, it might've even been like exclusively for our beer club. Um, but but it, you, you get a chance to present it with the full story. And I think we, we had a dinner, Brian referenced, where we had um, both a couple of people from Antiquum down and they're talking about their story and we're talking about what went into this beer. And when you present it and people understand everything that goes into it and then they're tasting it, it's, it's like a totally different experience where I think sometimes 
a beer like this might be hard to just pull off the shelf at the grocery store. Like you wouldn't really know what year you'd be like, what, what is this? Like, what did I buy? Like, I don't get it. Where like, if you're like for us, one of the benefits of, of, you know, having a club and like being able to present the beers to people is like, they get it right. They, they know everything that went into it and they, they, they totally get to experience the whole story. And then when they taste it, it makes sense instead of being confused. <laughs> right. And so that's yeah. what, like, it was actually super popular. It's been one of our most popular sort of club offerings. People were like, that beer is amazing. Like I love it. It pairs with anything that red wine pairs with and like, it's super cool. And what's cool is we had, as I said, we had the, the winemaker and the, and the, the, um, vineyard manager out to our dinner and they got to speak to our club and, you know, they brought the wine that was made with the same grapes from the same block. So you wow. could try the wine side by side with the beer. And it was just like, Dude, you know, cool. it's that story. And that's, what's so important to us that like I already said, it's like, if I bought this at Safeway, I'd be like, what, what, what's going on? But because we can, we can tell the story and, and, have each of these pieces put together for our club it's like it makes it a just way better experience overall yeah no that's very cool and i you know i'm getting a lot of the uh the the barrel off the side of the glass too that oak yeah yeah wow what a what a trippy beer dude i, don't, I hate to even like move on I want to say that it's it's the rare barrel that like their all of their wine beers are called like blurred, and I just I just feel like that's such a great characterization for this beer. It's like it's definitely like blurred line here. Like what what yeah. am I drinking? Is it is it beer? Is it wine? Is it something even better? Yeah. Well, actually, I I found a, a glass sort of shaped oh. like yours. It's the yeah, uh, there you go. the uh, rare barrel ambassador yeah. sour glass so there you go now i'm, I'm glad that uh, you guys aren't a warring faction and i can uh stop, oh, no, hi we're, stop we're, hiding the label it is the beer industry there's very few <laughs> warring factions yeah i know that's why i, I thought it was funny especially those <laughs> guys too like jay and alex can't i don't think they can get angry <laughs> they just get sleepy they just whoa hey <laughs> 10 o'clock and all is well <laughs> um yeah fantastic beer that was really good I really appreciate that. I don't know why I'm going through puberty right now, but it's really good, guys. All <laughs> right, what's the next beer I should crack open here? Or are we going to try to make it through all six? Or yeah, hell yeah, uh, hell yeah! All right, then let's go. <laughs> let's go, uh, Cherry Parliament next. Let's do it. Yeah, I like to try to make it through all six. It, it. These are the times when I'm a little disappointed that it's only me. <laughs> well, you know it's I mean? also like. Again, our our wild our wild and sour beers are all you know bone dry, so they're high alcohol. And then our bourbon barrel aged beers that we're getting into are high alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's a it's a good thing I'm not driving because I'm just at my house. But like, oh, yeah, there you it's go. like it feels like these are the times I feel bad. You know, <laughs> the pandemic and whatever, and it's just like we have to have something to talk about. But you know, I, on the other hand, I just. I, I, I want to be able to share these with people because they're, they're beers to, to, to share. I can't drink them all tonight. Yeah, exactly. Or you could, you might call in sick to work tomorrow, but you could. Yeah, for sure, man. I got to work tomorrow night too. <laughs> the shitty thing about working for yourself, man. <laughs> you, just, you can't get fired. Uh, okay. This is cherry parliament. Sour red ale uh, aged with cherries in wine and bourbon barrels. Oh man, I feel like I'm uh, I'm in trouble here. Tell me a little bit about Cherry Parliament, please. Yeah, so this is a uh, um, an interesting beer. Its name comes from just as simply as P Funk was on the radio when we were blending this beer, so it's called Parliament. Uh, <laughs> Fuck, I love that. That just the most simple origin story in the entire world. <laughs> yeah, Parliament Funkadelic all the way. But yeah. uh, well, that's also like touch of Brett was the first beer we ever bottled and we're like shoot we need to come up with a name for this because it was like literally the night before the first release or whatever that we're like stand up way too late and like whatever as, as always you're like behind the eight ball on this stuff and it was touch of gray grateful dead on okay. the video, which is a which is a song that everybody loves in eugene for sure yeah. Ryan especially a huge grateful dead fan 
And he's like, well, why don't we just call it touch prep? And we're like, sure, that sounds good. And then you win a, a gold medal at GAVF and you're like, maybe we should have thought through that name a little harder, maybe <laughs> there was something that we wanted to like continue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like now it's stuck. Like we're never going away from that name. <laughs> you can't do it, man. You can't do it. Yeah. Um, so this beer is pretty fun. So uh kind of a a challenge that that we have we have talked about, Matt and I had always talked about was like how do you know, how do you get roast malt character and sour beer without having it be super astringent? Because um, generally when a beer really dries out, it's like that roast bitterness comes through astringent. You get, it just, it, I don't know, it's hard to do. And I'm not saying that we nailed it here. I think there's, you know, in all of our beers, we have room to grow. Um, but it's been a fun, it's been a fun process. And this is a beer that we probably touch more than any of our other beers. So this is, you know, our, our red, red ale that we primary ferment in stainless with our mixed culture. It goes down into French oak for uh, over a year. We found that our red beers um, take, a, take much longer to kind of mature than, than our blonde based beers do. Then it went on to fresh cherries from Hood River, fermented on those, went back into French oak until it was ready. And then, and then we, um, we wanted to add some body with this beer so it went into um, actually second use bourbon barrels that were our our that held our barley wine beforehand so it's unrinsed bourbon barrel aged barley wine barrels that then this went into for just a couple of months um, before packaging to kind of round out the acid and to give it a little more body um, and in general i think i think American oak, or I shouldn't just say all American oak, but I think that bourbon barrels are, are not the greatest to age sour beer in because they add so much oxygen, um, just the way that they're built. Really? Um, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So bourbon barrels are, are very crudely put together because a, a bourbon distillery is like, uh, we're going to use this thing once and that's it. So it's, right. if you, you know, next time anybody who's listening is at a brewery um, and they see bourbon barrels, it's like, you'll notice none of the staves overlap really. They're just kind of jammed together and they are, yeah. Like Frankenstein barrel. And then you look at a winery in French Oak and they're all like very clean, like they're cut specifically for each other. And, and, and it's very nice and, and tight. Um, whereas, so by nature, bourbon barrels just, just let in a ton more oxygen than, than wine barrels do. So um, it tends towards acetic character in sour beers, I think. Um, so just like kind of the touch at the end of kind of the, the, the second use bourbon character with some of the barley wine character that was in the barrels before that. Um, just makes this a, a really, you know, kind of interesting, complex beer that we make, but yeah, just yeah. complex. <laughs> yeah. And, right. And, and <laughs> I'm having a hard time describing this beer and you and I both describe this beer for a living now. Um, it, this is very complicated. God, that aroma. I, I don't know what it is about your beers, man, but, but the aromas I, I'm just infatuated with <laughs> in, and of, in and of themselves, they are a whole different enjoyable experience. And this is no, this is no different. The cherries, I mean, the, you, you sort of get like wine coming through, maybe a little bit of the bourbon, I guess, you know, I, I don't really know, especially just in the aroma. I feel like I'm going to get carbon dioxide poisoning. <laughs> I'm going to pass out from just snorting the gas in here. But God, that smells amazing. It smells like a, almost like a rich, chocolate bar but not really but like like a chocolate wine cordial i don't know maybe that's it's definitely a chocolatey note so we just yes. released this beer last weekend and we always do food pairings with our with our beer releases and this was paired with a chocolate like a bittersweet chocolate ice cream because we thought that like that chocolate note was worth playing up i mean it's definitely like an interesting element of kind of the chocolate sour cherry like all the malt in there, I think distinguishes it from a lot of our other fruited sour beers. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What are amazingly smelling beer. And it's, I don't want to say it's balanced because it's not balanced. It's very tart. <laughs> um, but in a good way, you, you, you get some wine tannin, some wine, I'm, I'm going to say wine acidity, and I, I don't necessarily know if that's what I mean, but that's what I'm going to go with. That combines with the tartness. There's, uh, yeah, you, I mean, I could probably pull a little bourbon out, sort of like buried deep in the mid palate there. But I think it works really well to sort of balance that 
that bright, that acidity, you know, out. You definitely get a wine component in the aftertaste. And the cherries are all there basically all the way through. Yeah, I, I don't think you could have, I don't think you could like construct a beer on purpose much more complex than this. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you took all the pieces and like made a Lego set of the beer flavor wheel yeah, or sure. whatever, I don't think you could really, it, it seems impossible. It seems like this is just sort of like its own thing that happens within the barrel. And this is, you know, this is what it is. It, it, it seems like, yeah, I don't even, I guess I don't really know what I'm saying. You couldn't, it feels like you couldn't replicate this because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of layers and it's, it's like the, the, the last beer, the Tour project, it's sort of like ebbs and flows with the flavorings. Yeah, there's a handful of beers that we make that I, I wish that I could get every person that ever drank the beer to like walk through the process with me. And I have such a different experience because I'm like tasting, tasting the beer from start to finish, right? And this is one of those examples and our Creek actually is another one that we just we released a few releases ago, but um, the similar where it's like you taste it and then you taste it before it was aged in the second use bourbon barrels and you taste it after and you're like, you're like, so distinctly like that is what rounded it out that is what did this it's not like you know it's tough because it's, it's not we're not imparting a ton of bourbon flavor which is what you normally do when you add a beer to bourbon barrels but it was like yeah like okay the beer beforehand was was really angular and sharp and then the beer afterwards was more rounded and had a little bit more body and it's one of those things that same thing before it had the cherries on it you add the cherry element, then you add the, the, the second use bourbon element, and then you add the bottle conditioning element, which always kind of like elevates these beers. It's really just like such a cool journey throughout that I wish that I could just have everybody like it came in a little, came in a little pack that's like, this is what it tastes like first. This is what happened <laughs> after I did this. This is what happened after I did this. Uh, you, should, you should do a little, a little podcast. Yeah, there we go. Like for every release, I'm I'm just I'm like a podcast advocate, but like especially for breweries, for like every release that you do, you just do a little 15, 20 minute thing or whatever, and you know, there you go. Tasting yeah. so they can yeah, taste totally. it with you. Yeah, yeah so it's one of those beers that it just like kind of all came together at the end, and it was like uh, I don't know, it's 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 very it's it's a, it's a complex beer. Like if you had to describe it in two words, I don't think you could. You, um, you really can. It's like <laughs> it's like chocolate without the sweetness and also cherries without the sweetness and acid like <laughs> but that doesn't do it justice right no what a tremendous beer man i'm really impressed with it i've, I've i can honestly say i've never had anything like this beer nice wow yeah that's rad man so was this part of the club stuff as well or is this for just you know the plebes too um, this, this one was, um, was distributed throughout the Northwest. It'll be a little bit in California, um, Nevada, kind of. Okay. Are you guys, uh, primarily in Oregon or? That's the majority of it, but yeah. we have sold a little bit to a lot of places as, as somewhat of a niche brewery. We have been sought out by a handful of kind of random importers. And so we, we sell beer, a little bit of beer in Asia, a little bit in Europe um kind of random states on the east coast um so kind of little little drops here and there kind of i mean the way that probably rare barrel does or cascade or some of these other kind of more niche uh small producers i imagine you have you know like you said random people just hitting you up for you know cases here and there whatever that's got to be still a, a cool feeling i mean you know your your beer is halfway across the world it's very cool like i, yeah. I got to uh I got to go to a festival in Norway a couple of times, which was oh, awesome, nice. you know, and like we went to London Craft Beer Fest. There's been, yeah, being able to cool go stuff. to like Hunapu Day and, and I mean, some of that is, is like pretty awesome. I mean, you get the invite or like even just to like Firestone Walker's Terroir Project. It's like a huge right. honor that was, to be a part of that. Huge one. Right. And so, and so <laughs> you like some of these, it's like, wow, this is really cool. Somebody across the world heard of our beer and thinks it's good enough that they want to bring us to a festival. Yeah, for sure. Like, let's go to Norway for this festival. <laughs> is it is it is it profitable? No, no way. But it's awesome. <laughs> it's yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I've always heard Jamil talk about at Heretic, where it's like, you know, I can go to this festival in Norway or Singapore, but I'm never distributing 
in Singapore. So what there's no benefit for me other than just having a cool experience, right? And connecting with people. Yeah. And I think that's sort of that's the whole point of craft beer, I think, is the connection with people and, and sort of figuring out how other people taste. And then you guys can sort of like compare notes and whatever. And like that's that that cultural experience, that communal experience that we're all sort of fighting for still. Yeah, it's it's generally really inspiring too because you go to you know you go to a random place whether it's you know whether it's another brewery in Oregon or another brewery in California or China or, well we haven't been to China yet but our beers in China but you know you go you go <laughs> any to any of these festivals and talk to the brewers and you're like hey it's cool that we're all like you know we have this common thread that we can this through line that's like kind of bonds us that we're these craft beverage producers. Yeah. But then you just come back and you're super inspired because you're like, oh man, they did this way differently and they do this differently. And I had this flavor profile there that I've never had before. Or like we're at this restaurant and we had this food that was crazy. Let's like figure out how to meld those flavors with something. So it's just like, I don't know, just, just you, you got to get out of your bu bubble and you got to get out of your cellar palate and just like That's experience true. as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to take our very last break. We're going to come back. We have two beers to get through. I'm looking at the descriptions now. I'm a little nervous. Yeah, they're I'm, big beers. I'm going to try to get through both of them uh, because they sound delicious, and, and that's what we're all about here. So hang on, everybody. It's the session. We're on with Ale Song, and we'll be right back. Hey, thanks for hanging around, everybody. It's the session. We are winding things up, but before we do, we have two high-alcohol beers to drink, and uh, by we, of course, I mean myself. And maybe my cat. I don't know. We'll see. Just don't call the uh, animal shelter on me or whatever. Uh, boys, what should I drink first? The maestro or the breakfast suit? We should probably do the maestro first. But maestro. Um, Brian and I both still have to drive. So we're probably going to have small amounts of this. <laughs> lot, but, okay. But it's okay because we're professionals. Yeah. Uh, cowards. But that's okay. That's fine. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, oh, Classic blunder. I don't have an opener in here. I know we spoiled you with a with some cork cork and cake. Really did, yeah. So hang on, let me go grab a let me grab a thing. All right. Okay. I got my, uh, my trusty opener. So tell me a little bit about the maestro, please. First, I want to tell you about our, uh, our, our top, the closure on top. So we used to wax dip all these bottles. Oh God. Yeah. And we switched to, uh, we switched to these heat shrink PVC capsules. Um, mainly because we get like a ton of our club members would come up to us every release and be like, what's the trick to opening wax? Like, wax, I hate wax. It sucks. It's awful. It really does. And we're all kind of like, well, we have like, we, we prided ourselves on very thin wax too, that you could get in with a, with just an opener and be fine. But, um, we, uh, we caved to, to switch to these heat shrink capsules because we think they, A, they look great. Um, but B, the, the bonus of it is that it makes production way easier. We're not hand, hand dipping all our wax anymore, which is awesome. But, yeah, I mean, I don't. All we ever heard, all we ever heard, was like super negative about wax, and then we switched to this, and then all we heard was like, "But I love wax. Oh, <laughs> How dare you?" Yeah, you're never gonna please everybody. I remember yeah. like at um, working at Morby years ago when we we were getting into like wax dipping stuff on the wine side, and like the the wax we got was like super easy to break apart. Um, you can almost like pull it in a string, but it smelled like old cheese. Oh sure. So that was real weird. Um, yeah. And then I don't know, wax is just weird. There is something cool and tactile about like pulling the wax apart. Um, but I, I personally much prefer the heat shrink cause I could just pop it off with the top. I don't, you know, the, the, the top comes off, it separates easy. It's fine. It's great. I yeah. love it. I, I love the wax and I didn't think it was that hard to get open, but we had so much feedback from people that were like, we can't open your bottles. And we're yeah. like, all right, all right. Yeah. It's not hard except when it is, it's like one of those things where it's either like on or off. It's like easy to come off or it just breaks apart and it's brittle. And then it's weird and it gets under your thumbnail. 
and it gets in the bottle and then it's in your yeah, glass. That's the air. <laughs> yeah man yeah so uh, or then somebody who gets frustrated and takes their knife to it and then cuts themselves and you're like whoa what why are you doing that <laughs> yeah it's like calm down everybody uh all right maestro bur- uh, barley wine ale aged in bourbon barrels it's a 13 percent beer for your boy here damn yeah so we we make this beer every other year i'd say um and it's just a uh you know we still like we still like bourbon barrel aged barley wines <laughs> um but it's really fun because you know most most bourbon barrel aged beers these days and ours too rhino suit that we'll taste next is like you know very chocolate forward very vanilla forward and it's cool just to go back to the barley wines that are just super caramel forward and and just kind of classic. So this is our, yeah, bourbon barrel aged barley wine. And, and it's English style, so this is not the like hoppy, bitter American style barley wine. It's very smooth. It's very much like a, a you know, you're sipping on on brandy or bourbon or something. It's just it's kind of like a one of my favorites to drink in the winter time. Kind of just you know sitting there watching the rain come down and sipping on this. This. I smelled it in my glass and it, it brought me back to the, and this is, you know, I apologize as a crossover, but it brought me back to the, the first and only time I visited a hair of the dog. Nice. And it's just that it, it was like brew day and it's that mash smell. And, you know, uh, there's English style, like kind of old ale, you know, aromatics in the air. And like, it just instantly brought me back to that weird ass gravel, like industrial park. <laughs> vibe man it's uh yeah that that is such a good i i don't know what it, i don't know what you guys are doing there but the the aromatics in your beers really uh it's like a loudspeaker for what is in the glass and it, uh, consistently across the board and i feel that's very hard to do the, the what you smell is a representation of what's in the glass and i know that that seems counter or not counter to but it seems obvious but it's not always that way not every beer sort of showcases what you're about to taste in the aromatics there's some of it but yours are so complex i'm going to ask you if you know why and i know there's no answer to it but i'm going to ask you anyway why do you think that is well, i i think they're like i mean obviously like the, the process right our average beer takes 18 months to make right <laughs> this is not a this is not a none of those beers were kettle soured um, none of these are just something that we, we cranked out as quickly as possible in stainless. Um, I think on the bourbon barrel age side, you know, we're, we're super fortunate. Uh, our third business partner had a ton of experience as a pub brewer, uh, working kind of super early on in the like bourbon barrel aging days. Um, and his recipes, it's like 57 specialty malts. So this is like a very malt. <laughs> forward beer yeah. but like tons of complexity from it's like oh, okay and we're gonna add like a half a bag of this and like he he just like has a really great palette for some of these like bigger malt forward beers um on the hot side and i think you know people sometimes characterize barrel aged breweries they want to characterize you as like oh you're that sour beer brewery or like oh you're that bourbon barrel aged brewery and we're kind of like all of the above and i think people you know, have seen the model where it's like, oh, it's all about blending and the, the base beer doesn't matter. But we're big believers that actually know the base beer does matter. The malt matters, like the like brewing the wort matters, like all those things go into a complex balanced beer. It's not just what happens in the cellar. So it's a little bit of everything. And, and I think we, I feel very fortunate to have ended up in this partnership with kind of both Matt, who had so much hot side experience, and, and Brian, who's like really locked in on the cellar on the cold side um, to kind of like pull this all together. And, and you end up having, you know, pretty consistent complex beers kind of across the spectrum, which is pretty fun. Yeah, I think the, the other on top of that, and, and it is funny, like whenever a brewer sees a, a, a mash bill that Matt comes up with, especially for rhino soup, this beer is actually pretty simple for, for one of Matt's recipes. Um, I think it only has a handful of malts, but rhino soup, yeah, it's like, I don't know, 15 malts or something. Good but Lord. it's a, the kitchen sink, if you will. But the, uh, yeah. um, it's, it's, it, it comes back to like, 
you know, because we focus on barrel aging, because that's all we do, um, we're able to like leverage relationships that other breweries can't really have. Like when we order bourbon barrels at a truckload, we can be like, hey, throw, throw a handful of these in, throw a handful of these in, throw a handful of these in, and we can go through and we can really pick out like, like the barrels that we like the best and, and, and statistically like the best from year to year to year. Um, so it really gives us a, an opportunity to, to like really dial in the flavor profile that we like um, because we, we have the room and the headspace to experiment with this as opposed to, you know, when I was working for an IPA brewery, it was like, okay, that's just a side project that you do. Like, you don't, you know, spend a ton of money or a ton of time on that. Um, and this is like, you know, we've trialed the bourbon barrels that we like. And, and it's funny because Heaven Hill is the barrel that we like the best, but it's also like the whiskey that I would never buy, right? Like most Heaven Hill whiskey barrels are Evan Williams. And, you know, I don't gravitate towards Evan Williams when I'm at the liquor store. <laughs> right. But then we go through and like Basil Hayden is my favorite bourbon and, and we got Basil Hayden barrels in and we're just like, oh man, this makes terrible bourbon barrel aged beer. Does it really? Why? Because Basil Hayden is, is fucking rad. It's great. Yeah, but it's super yeah. subtle. It doesn't really come through in the beer. And then you have Heaven oh. Hill that's just kind of like, you know, when we work with other purveyors, like when we work with guys that uh, here in town that, that roast cocoa nibs or import vanilla or coffee roasters, for example, they're always like, what are the nuanced flavors that you want for all these things? And when we're looking for an adjunct, and especially for bourbon barrels, it's like, we want bourbon flavor. And it turns out that Heaven Hill is bourbon flavor. <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> and it's like, the barrels are reliable they're they're generally well treated for all these things that like we've gone through a ton of other distilleries that aren't that case and it's like when we want coffee it's like we want coffee flavored coffee you know we don't right. need blueberry flavor in our coffee because if we wanted blueberries we'd add blueberries um or whatever so it's just like the the more consistent um kind of you know bourbon flavor and and evan williams seems to like or at heaven hill uh seems to like just fill the you know fill that that niche that we that we need that's super interesting because yeah i i would have just assumed that like basil hayden or um blanton's or something like that right like the right. The, the the bourbons and the whiskeys that you like to drink would clearly be the choice yeah right. we were all disappointed we all had our horses in the race i was like rooting for the woodford and then it was like the worst one on the table <laughs> <laughs> wow that's a good woodford pun too because they're the bourbon of the kentucky <laughs> derby exactly uh, there's so many directions I want to go with this beer and I, it, it's hard for me to, to pick one. I get, I get a, uh, this is, might sound weird, but I get a banana bread, like a, like a, like a ripe banana with like a cinnamon thing, not in a, in a bad way. Cause you usually we'll talk about banana esters as like, oh, you have a funky Hefeweizen or whatever, but it's not like that. It's, it's such a, a unique animal. It's such a unique experience to be tasting this beer um, because it works so entirely. It's like overdone banana bread. And that's, I don't know why I'm getting that, but it's like when you get the, the sugars that caramelize sort of on the outside of the, of the crust of the bread, like the heel of the bread. I don't know if I'm talking. It's really, no, it's, I'm laughing. We're both laughing because we were just, we were doing a collaboration with the shoots. Uh, that's coming out soon. Um, it's a it's a Belgian dark strong and several other things, Asian spirits barrels. But we're sitting there in the tasting, and I look at Doug and I'm just like, doesn't this taste like mom's banana bread? And then Doug's <laughs> like, yeah, it does. And then Ben, <laughs> the 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 assistant brewmaster over there that's in charge of the barrel program is like, well, my mom's banana bread tastes different. So, <laughs> like so, so, so he's he's like recording notes <laughs> on the on the whiteboard and he's like. Coombs banana bread. <laughs> yeah, but, fair enough. Like with chocolate we chips. Get that. Yeah, we get that. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think with this is like, and, it, and I think it's because so so our imperial milk stout that we do rhino suit, um, and then variations on rhino suit, which we'll take taste next, um, is so just your classic like stout flavors, chocolate, vanilla, roast. That and we do that a ton, and then this barley wine we do every every couple of years. And then we also do a scotch ale every couple of years. And we really like try to make these like a, a, a big difference between the two where it's like rhino suit is this chocolate forward, this roast forward beer and maestro and Kentucky kilt or scotch ale and bourbon barrels are like, you know, we're trying to find the other elements of, of the barrel, the bourbon barrel character that we can get, which is like the, the, the spice, the kind of 
uh, caramel, the, the brown sugar aspect, mm-hmm. like almost, you know, all the kind of nuances that you lose in like a big stout come through in these beers. And, you know, part of that, of course, is the malt bill, right? Where we're, where sure. we're eating just like really good malts that come through as, you know, biscuity almost, but, but just, just, you know, the, the, the brown sugar-esque and, and caramel-esque, but the, as opposed to just like the kind of oh, hit you over the head with the like coffee, chocolate, vanilla side. So it's a cool aspect of just like the bourbon character that comes through as well as the, the base beer, that's just like a really good dichotomy of like what bourbon barrel aged beers can be between Rhino Suit and then the Maestro, which is our barley wine. Yeah, and you know, I, I appreciate that it's more of the English focus, that it's not super big because you a lot of the flavors that you get in there, I think would sort of be munched up by the sort of darker classic, you know, American barley wine flavors. It's sort of, it's subtle, it's, it's great. This is a great, it's great beer. And it's big enough too that this is this is one of the beers that I'd say that most of our beers um we age for you, so you should drink them, you know, <laughs> yeah. relatively soon after after getting them, because we think that's when they taste best. Yeah. Um, but this is one of those beers that is just like you open this month after month, it's like six months, year after year, and it's just like it's better and better. This is this is definitely an, a sellable, really fun beer to see how it evolves. I could see that. How do you keep your clean beer separate from your, you know, your Brett beers and your sour beers and stuff like that? Is that a, is that a, ch- a challenge in the brewery or is there a separate facility across the parking lot or whatever? Yeah. So it's about 20 miles away. Oh, is it really? Okay, great. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that so far our, enough away? I don't know. But I mean, there's an asterisk <laughs> for that because all of our, we share fermentation vessels. Um, and so when we, and we share a packaging line. Okay. Um, but when we, we go through and we're, we're transitioning a, a, a stainless steel vessel from a wild ferment to a, a quote unquote clean ferment. Okay. Um, it's like an all day CIP where normally, in a, in a, you know, a normal production brewery, it's like a two hour CIP, right. To transition between, between beers, but mm-hmm. it's an all day thing. It's like every soft part gets boiled or replaced. Wow. Uh, the tank gets steamed. So it gets up to 185 degrees. Um, it's just a, a whole process. Like if, if you worked with, you know, we have a very small team. It's me, uh, Matt on the hot side and then Joe and Huck on the, in the cellar. And if anybody worked with Brett, they're like not touching clean beers that day. Um, wow. But that's, it's, hey, damn. It's, it's like steam is our best friend, like hot, you know, heat treatment is our best friend. So, so that's the biggest thing. But uh, the actual storage and cellaring of the beers in barrels. It's like all the wild beers stay out on our countryside property and all the, uh, again, quote unquote clean. I hate the word clean. I wish we could come up with a better word than clean. Why? Why um, do you hate clean? Because that infers that the opposite is dirty. And I, I don't know. I just don't. Okay. Well, you know what? I, I, I think I get it because of the way that you're doing your bread. You're treating, right. you're, you're pitching it as like a lager rate pitching and you're treating it like that's just the yeast instead of I'm contaminating my beer with this thing. Right, exactly. I okay, I get it. Um, Your brain worms are now in my head, so I appreciate yes, it. Yes, yeah. great success. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but the, the barrels, when they're aging for the, you know, the, the months and months are, are in, a, in a warehouse in town um, that's, you know, several miles away from it. Okay. But we, when we first started, it was all in the same warehouse. And when we gave our tour, we always tongue-in-cheek said that there was a... Uh, what do we say? Like there's an invisible micro barrier that kept all the bread <laughs> on one side and the sack on the other side. And they were like, oh man. <laughs> yeah. Early on, yeah, I forget who it was. I want to say it was Vinny, but I don't think that's true. But like early on when we were doing these shows, we would have a brewer. Oh God, I wish I knew who it was. Um, I want to maybe it's even Michael Ferguson. Anyways, who was like, whenever I'm like, they wineries in the area and i have friends who are winemakers they know that i'm working with brett and they won't let me in their winery they won't let me in the barrel room just because they're that like cautious of like the you know transfer of bacteria we've definitely been told by the guys at king estate who is a hundred feet away that we have to drive 20 miles back to town shower and change our clothes before we could come up the hill and like go in their winery 
Are they serious? Like it's a yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, we do this again tomorrow morning. You come here first. Okay. <laughs> then the, uh, Damn. Yeah, the, it's always the joke. I always get a phone call. I mean, retinomyces is like you know, it's everywhere, right? It's just yeah. in the air. It's everywhere. It's in, it's on the fruit skins, especially that. So no matter what winery you are, you're gonna get like a couple of infected barrels, no matter what. And whenever this happens at the winery next door. I'm the first one that they called. They're like, what did you do? <laughs> they're, jo they're joking, but they're just like, it's your fault. I know it's your fault. <laughs> oh, man. You were over here. I saw the, the cameras. Yeah. Senor Rhino. Senor Rhino. What is yeah. this beer? So I have it on my notes as, as a breakfast suit. Yeah, so that we sent you a different beer than our notes are. Oh, okay. All right, good. I just want to well, make sure that, that, that I'm... That was an accident, then somebody right. who filled out the form, maybe maybe me, uh, <laughs> might have messed it up. Um, so Senor Rhino... Senor Rhino. ...is a variant of our Rhino Suit series. So Rhino Suit is our Imperial Milk Stout aged in bourbon barrels. Um, it's actually one of, one of our investors who is a uh, winemaker in Sonoma. When we were sitting down to get some investment from him, he, he was giving us a piece of advice and he was talking about uh, the best thing he's learned as a businessman was that you have to put on your rhino suit. And we're like, what are you talking about? And uh, so he told us there's, there's a whole long build up to the story, but basically he's like, when you are a businessman, people just put wall after wall after wall in front of you. And when they do that, you need to go back in your office Put on your rhino suit. You know what a rhino looks like? It's got the big fucking horns and the shoulders and everything. And you come out there and you just charge through that wall. And we're all like sitting there and we're kind of like, okay, okay. <laughs> <That's so tense. laughs> um, but we walked out of the meeting and we're like, that's the first beer name that we that we have in our cellar. And and it's it's stuck. This is a big beer, but it's a pretty smooth beer. So it's got like a little bit of lactose in it. So it's got just like that hint of sweetness. This is not overly cloying but that little bit of sweetness makes it so much smoother. I mean, the way that bourbon is smoother than scotch, um, just like really like makes it drinkable. Uh, Asian bourbon barrels. The one that you're drinking is the Senor Rhino, which is our Mexican hot chocolate variant. Uh, so ancho chilies, uh, cocoa nibs, um, cinnamon and vanilla. And that I think was a bronze medal at GABF, um, but just, Oh. really like a cool beer blending all those flavors together on top of the really chocolatey base of the rhino suit. I get like a, <clears throat> like a pipe tobacco in a way that I've never had before. And it, it, it seemed, look, I'm being honest. I'm not trying to blow smoke. It just is happening. Okay. We're like, <laughs> we'll take it. Keep it coming. Yeah. Like you, you just, you know, you say, Oh, pipe tobacco or, or I've talked about this before where you sort of have in your, in your dictionary, your lexicon or whatever of like different descriptors and you use this and use that and whatever. It's sort of like the way awesome or I'm blown away or literally it doesn't, they don't, these words don't really mean anything anymore. We just use them. Um, and so we say pipe tobacco sometimes in beer where it's like, Oh yeah, sort of kind of like hints of pipe. This is fucking pipe tobacco. <laughs> like if you put it under my nose, I would think, okay, this is like a, like a, Oh, uh, what's that? major dickinson no that's a coffee <laughs> anyway some like some blend of like a, just like a just like a deep sweet pipe tobacco thing that's a, it with is in the chocolate and it sort of smells like mexican hot chocolate the abuelita i think it is or whatever and then the chili wow this is it's weird. like a very small hint of chili i think one of the things with chili beers is that it builds on you over time. So you like really don't want to overdo it on the first sip because you want people to finish their glass and not be on fire. Right. right, right. Yeah, cinnamon. There's cinnamon in here, right? I'm not just making yeah, that up. Sure, yeah. Cinnamon, yeah. See, this is another this this is okay. I now I don't like you guys because this is another beer that like it the the aromas are changing every time. I mean, I, I'm I'm obviously kidding because I I think that's cool. <laughs> But it's very hard to do. I th I think. I mean, the amount of beers that I smell and taste in a year, it, it it's like these are standing out in this category specifically because of how well well blended or well done that they are. I think I think that goes back to like 
the fact that we don't want our beer to be one dimensional. We, we don't want our beer to be so like, like we don't want our Imperial stouts and bourbon barrels to just be hot and sweet. And that's like the way the trend is going. We don't want our sour beers to just be sour with fruit. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's so important to us that our beers are drinkable and balanced. And what that ends up doing is that the beer just evolves through the glass because there's not one flavor just like super overpowering all the other, other flavors. So this beer is super interesting because cinnamon is one of those things that's like uh, one of the spices that we've worked with that just like ebbs and flows so much. And, and when we first packaged the beer, the cinnamon wasn't there. And I, I wrote okay. my notes like, not enough cinnamon, we need to redo this. And then like three weeks later when we released it after we packaged it, it was like, way too much cinnamon <laughs> and I wrote my notes back off cinnamon this is not enough and then now when you drink it it's like it's like oh it's just this like layer of complexity that goes in and it's I think mean, it's fine right and the same with the coconuts and the ancho chilies it's just like we want you to taste each of those elements without one of them just like beating you over the head with it yes and and that's exactly what I taste I mean I, I, if if any I don't know. I, I, I think sometimes I, I maybe go a little bit overboard, but I'm serious. If, if any beer can make me shut up, <laughs> it would be this beer because there's, there, there's so much going on. And it is, like you said, it's not one pokes out. It, it, it all sort of combines, but they, they get equal chances. Some sticks out, some doesn't. You get the, the cinnamon, you get the cocoa underneath. Uh, the vanilla sort of like, you know, pokes out here and there. The chili is under riding, uh, you know, underneath. And that helps combine with the cinnamon to sort of bring that up. But then you also get the, the ancho chili sort of smokiness. It's a, it's a wild, uh, it's wild. How long have you been making the, uh, the rhino, the rhino soup beers? Since the beginning, it sounds like. But that was actually like the very first beer we brewed. Touch of Brett was the first one we blended. Um, mm. And so okay. Rhino Soup was the very first one we brewed. It was like right at like the second we got our TTB license, we we're making a making a stout for bourbon barrels. Oh. Um, what's cool with this beer is that it's it's a by itself, it's an absolutely delicious beer. Um, and it holds its own, of course, but um, it's also a really good palate or or uh, you know, what am I looking for? A really good just like just 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 canvas, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay, canvas yep. to, to, for all these other adjuncts that we can use on it. So we often make this beer and um, and then we'll do small variants of the final blend to with with other adjuncts, whether it's vanilla, whether it's chocolate, whether it's the senior that you had mixing hot chocolate or coconut or whatever. And it's just a really fun thing for us to do with our with our club. Um, and just the way we release our beers. So we release, all of our beers are available to our club. We release beer four times a year. Um, and Doug can speak more to this, but we release our beers four times a year. There's four or five beers per release. Um, a couple of each release goes to distribution and the rest is club and tasting room only. Um, and it's just like a really cool way. The club is, is a really cool way. And, and this is the, to experiment with people that are bought in and again, we're not putting out like, like bad beers to them by any means, but it's just like, you know, as we talked about with the Antiquum beer and then with, with some of our other adjunct beers, it's just like, it's like, hey, these guys get Ale Song and they get what we're about. So we can do this like kind of weird thing and get their feedback on it. And then, and then if we want, transition that to a wholesale batch. And, and um, they're going to listen to the whole story, right? right. Like they're going to get it before they make a judgment. So, so that, that's like really fun for us to have that almost as like our pilot system, right? To know that you have people who are bought in and they're like, cool, we're really excited to hear the whole story. And then we'll try it and be like, wow, this is amazing. Or whatever. Right. See, and this is where your podcast comes in. So once a quarter before yeah. the shipment, <laughs> You record, you do the tasting, and then you send it in the in the email link, and then people listen to it, or you know whatever. Um, we, do little, we do little, you know, videos for each beer. Okay. But actually, 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 you got a little QR code on the back there. That no you, way. You can scan and watch a little video about each beer a after the show. I, no, I'm going to do it right now. We're going to sit in silence while I figure <laughs> no. out my phone. I don't really understand it still. As long as it's not one that I'm doing, because I hate that sound of my own voice. <laughs> That's cool. Think about the podcast. I'm telling you, uh, Mike in the chat says, "Do you sh does the club ship to California?" Which is the same question I have now. Uh, 
Uh, yes. So we don't directly, but we do through Tabor, which I'm sure a lot of mm -hmm. uh, your listeners have heard of. But basically, they have partnered with us, and we essentially do a shipment to them every quarter, and then they can get it to all of the states that they ship to, which is something like 30 states or something pretty good. Um, and they handle the logistics on that. Unfortunately, laws are a little weird in this country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they really are, man. Yeah. That's very frustrating. It's really cool. So it's it's once a quarter and our out-of-state members um they can't come to all the releases, although we'd encourage you. Beria is just a quick seven hour drive away. <laughs> so <Yep>. yeah, something <laughs> like four that. times a year. But hey, hey, Southwest just started Eugene yeah. to Oakland Direct. Yeah, Eugene to Oakland Direct. Really? Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's for all of our club members in the Bay Area. But uh but it's a eight bottle shipment to our out of state members. And it's, it's, you know, this one, we released four beers. So it was two of each. Um, and it's otherwise we always prioritize the, like the, the smaller volume ones to our club. So if we have a beer that's, you know, doesn't make it anywhere else, the club gets more bottles of that than, you know, anybody else. So it'd be like three or four bottles of that would go to the club. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's a fun thing. And, and we have benefits at our tasting room. Um, our, our countryside wine tasting room is, it has, has set, been set up. So we, we do guided tasting so we can really like walk people through our beers and then suggest food pairings. And sometimes we, we pair food with those. Um, and then club members can just show up anytime they want and just enjoy the patio or whatever. And then we have another tasting room in Eugene, um, that club members still get their discount out. So your discount at. So it's like, we really, uh, we, pro we we really like prioritize our club members. They're so Good. important to us and they're so bought in. Yeah. Um, and I think Doug and I have both been part of wine clubs that have just burned us where it's like, oh, we have this wine that we can't sell. So we'll just unload it on our wine club. Uh, <laughs> and we definitely try to not do that. Yeah. And, and yeah. are really conscious about like, oh, this one, the club's going to really like, so let's prioritize this to the club. And you can also switch and, and transition things. So it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't know, it's a fun, fun thing that not many brewers are doing. Yeah, no, that sounds really cool. Uh, and then Ben now is going, what about to Australia? Well, that, that's a bit of a stretch, but we did send some beer to Australia, I think. Ooh. Well, it was probably like pre-COVID, so it's probably been a while. <laughs> so some of, it, some of it is probably still tasting really good, and some of it is probably uh, sold out. Sold out. <laughs> oh, man. Well, there you go, Ben. You poke around the uh, very small country of australia i'm sure you'll find it yeah there's a random bottle shop that has some rhino seed in it i'm sure <laughs> absolutely man those are the best well boys uh i'm gonna let you go man i really appreciate the time and the the hang and especially the beers uh this was really great where can people go to find more information about ale song beers so alesongbrewing.com is our website uh as you saw there's a little bit of a video that explains a little bit about what we do although two hours in these guys probably know more than they need to know so instagram <laughs> is at ale song brewing facebook i think it's the same twitter is the same so follow us there and uh great and come visit us in eugene that's definitely the best way i mean our our facility in wine country is absolutely stunning awesome awesome very good brian doug thank you very much guys i really appreciate it yeah, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, everybody, for joining us live on Facebook. Uh, if you want to join us live on, on, on Facebook, be sure to follow us on social media. And uh, Kim over there will, will definitely direct you to the date and time that is most appropriate for you to come and hang out with everybody in the chat room. I also want to thank More Beer. You can go to morebeer.com for absolutely everything you need to make great beer at home. They're, they're good people. They're trying to help you make good beer or mediocre beer if that's what you want. I, you know, I don't know why. I mean, uh, if you're anything like me and you brew a terrible homebrew, you can still get your equipment from more beer and your ingredients from more beer and uh, everything like that. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for tuning in. And until next time, we'll see you later.